Hello, and thank you for joining Mayor Brown's webinar series on preparing for the coming enforcement surge. Our program today will focus on SEC, CFTC, and DOJ enforcement trends. I'm going to take a second just to say that this is a somewhat unusual, intentionally unusual format for a webinar. Um, we are going to, uh, as you will see, and if you've taken a look at the slides that were forwarded to you, you've already seen, um, cover a, a fair amount of topics in a fairly short period of time intentionally and on purpose. Uh, we've got a great group of folks here today. I'm Rich Rosenfeld, and I'm a partner in, Was in the Washington, D.C. and New York offices of Mayor Brown. I'm the co-leader of the U.S. Securities Litigation and Enforcement Practice here, and I'm thrilled that, that my colleagues who've joined me today are Matt Kluchenik, Glenn Kopp, and Jackie Vallette. You know, Matt, if you take a second and introduce yourselves, and maybe we could all do that quickly, and then I'll, I'll come sure. back. Thanks, Rich. Hello, everyone. Matt Kluchenik, based in the Chicago office, partner at Mayor Brown, focused heavily on CFTC matters, exchange matters, trading generally involving derivative swaps, futures, cryptocurrencies, securities, and great to be here. So the plan is that we're going to bounce back and forth amongst each other. So I'm going to throw it for now, but Glenn, would you quickly introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, Rich. So Glenn Kopp, partner in the New York office here at Mayor Brown in the uh, white collar uh, government investigations and uh, compliance group, uh, former federal prosecutor from the Southern District of New York. And my work, as you can imagine, uh, runs the gamut of government investigations, internal investigations. When I say government, uh, mainly focused on DOJ, both um, here and abroad, as well as SEC enforcement cases and work with uh, my colleagues here on, on this panel and parallel cases as well. And, and I can't help but speak for a second. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, I'm thrilled to introduce Jackie Vallette. Uh, Jackie, who I, I knew by reputation and joined us in December, I am absolutely excited to, to let you introduce yourself as well, Jackie. Thanks, Rich. And hello to everyone on the panel, or I'm sorry, uh, listening in the audience today. Um, as, as Rich mentioned, I'm Jackie Vallette. I'm primarily based in the Mayor Brown Houston office. Um, I've previously practiced in California and so actually also hold an office in Los Angeles as well. My primary area of focus is um, all things securities litigation um, and, and enforcement. So that typically looks like um, SEC enforcement actions, SEC investigations, informal inquiries, as well as um, on the plaintiff side, um, more securities class actions, derivative suit, M&A litigation. Um, and then the third kind of component of my practice is a lot of um, more proactive compliance counseling on these same issues. Fantastic. Uh, thank you all. And before we begin, there's a couple of things that you need to know. Um, one of them is they, they make us say, but it is a really administrative matter. When you're accessing a webinar uh, for our, via our Zoom platform, is we understand that you should avoid software such as Citrix. So if you're getting any decrease or disruption or quality loss, it may be that you're going through some sort of VPN or something like that. It may help not to leave that to you. Uh, but more importantly, while we're speaking today, if you have any questions about the presentation, please use the Q&A feature on the bottom of the screen, uh, type it into your question. The way we're working, we're, we're intending to throw this back and forth, have a pretty vibrant discussion about each topic for a very short period of time, uh, would be happy to, and, and intend for you to be included. So anyone who's listening in who wants to jump in, if we can get to your question, we will. If not, we'll address it after today's program. That's what we're looking to do. Um, most importantly to many of you on the call, as much as I know you want to listen to, to the four of us, um, for CLE credit, as you, I'm sure you know by now, because we've all done this so many times, we'll provide an alphanumeric code during the presentation and towards the end of the presentation in order to receive CLE credit. Participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the log instru instructions for today's program. You need to return that within 10 days of the event in, a, in either of a couple of ways. You can either scan or take a photo of the form and email a copy to cle-events at mayorbrown.com, or you can fax the form to one 
seven seven one one. I, I this is the script we have to read, but I I am curious, and I'm going to find out uh, the number of people who fax their forms in. I didn't know that that was still an option in this day and age, so I'm just interested personally. But that's an aside. Let's begin. <laughs> uh this presentation i'll jump in because we've started on purpose um if we could turn the slide by the way to the next slide um we've put on purpose the idea of an overarching idea of our thoughts on the enforcement surge as a as a first thing to talk about so i'm going to do this my part of it in 30 seconds and i'm going to prompt uh, Jackie, that I'm going to come to her if she has anything to add on the SEC side. Obviously, we have this, this group on purpose. Glenn is, is first in DOJ, Matt and CFTC, but we all work together all the time, this group. And so this is a great group. Not only do we know each other, so hopefully it'll be an easy back and forth, but also because each of us, I think, will have things to say about each other's practice area. And that was sort of the intention here. Really quickly, you've had um, Gary Gensler say out loud that he intends to be aggressive, that uh, he has a serious legislative agenda that's being moved quickly um, for the SEC. And part of that agenda is for enforcement to be aggressive in a variety of areas that they are most interested in. You may call that legislating by enforcement, um, but that is certainly at least an aspect of what they intend to do. Being a guy named Rich Rosenfeld and having having always loved the alliteration of my name, I find it fascinating that he hired uh, another GG for the enforcement director position and enforcement director Gruwal um, has also come out and said that he is going to trust the staff, he doesn't have a tremendous background or grounding in securities law, although he was the attorney general in New Jersey. Um, he, he is an individual who I think is going to be um, deferential to the staff. They've said out loud that they're not going to automatically review uh, Wells submissions or Wells arguments at the, at the um, management level. So it's sort of a new day. And then where I'm going to stop talking and, and uh, is that what we're seeing anecdotally is a tremendous tick up in subpoenas. Um, they really are getting broad, getting, um, there's a, a variety of sweeps out there now. There are for a real uptick in the amount of cases that we are defending right now. And to me, that's a really interesting place to be. Jackie, you know, on the SEC, are you seeing the same things? I am seeing the same things. And it's interesting because if you look at the enforcement actions from 2021, you, you actually see that they're down. Um, most everybody has commented that that is not a sign of things to come. And I, I believe like Rich, it, it, it truly isn't. Um, it's actually pretty consistent with the trend that we've seen in other years where uh, a new chairman came into the SEC. Um, and, and obviously, in this case, Gensler didn't arrive until April 2021. Um, Gerwal then came, I think, in late July. And so, um, you know, they're, they're really just kind of getting started. I think some of the slow is also attributed still to the pandemic and coming out, hopefully, uh, of that. Um, and so, like Rich said, I, I don't think you can look at the numbers from 2021 um, and expect that they are um, going to indicate a trend downward. I think it's actually the other case. Um, what, what you'll see kind of throughout this presentation is, a, I think, a, a theme or trend from SEC where in, in really most of these categories, they've come out pretty strongly in public statements and um, speeches talking about how they are going to um, prosecute and enforce uh, these various subject matters. And then what we'll see is that they're really sticking to their word and in, in, in sort of the months following a lot of those public statements, we'll see, you know, the, the first enforcement action involving a specific um, entity with one of these subject matters. Um, and so I think what, what we're seeing here is, um, you know, SEC is really trying to, I think, get back some of um, the, the trust um, from the public that it has lost over uh, the last decade or so. Um, and so they're, you know, making these statements and then really trying to follow through, uh, at least in terms of what it looks like early on here in 2022. 
Matt, you want to give sure. us a CFTC? So the CFTC and uh, the, uh, the the derivatives exchanges in the U.S. have been firing on all cylinders for really the past five, six, seven years or so. Um, so uh, th that surge is in full force. Uh, for many years, there's a significant focus on spoofing and manipulation. That has abated a bit, uh, but still um, remains active. A number of other areas, the CFTC in particular, has been seeking to carve out um, areas relating to spot market uh, enforcement involving issues involving spot transactions. We'll talk about cryptocurrency a little bit, but whether it's cryptos or energy, uh, where you don't have a so-called commodity interest, which is essentially a swap or a futures contract, it's just a spot transaction, but there's an element, an allegation of fraud or manipulation. That has been a basis for CFTC enforcement. CFTC enforcement has been very aggressive about pursuing those areas. Same time, there's been a continued increased focus not only on entities, but also holding individuals accountable. We've seen this for a number of years now, and um, discussions with the staff um, often involve the relevant individual, individuals involved in the alleged wrongdoing. So uh, last year for CFTC enforcement, there was a slight dip, but I think that was largely for um, transitional reasons related to the commission. But all in all, it's been, um, it's been a, a tough environment where the CFTC has been uh, aggressive and very expansive. Um, also want to say before I turn it over to, to, to Glenn here, the CFTC continues to have a really close partnership with the DOJ. Not sure about the SEC and the DOJ, but we all know from so many of the spoofing and manipulation actions brought by the CFTC and then filed on by the DOJ, the closeness of that relationship. So maybe on that point, I will flip it over to Glenn. Thanks, Matt. Um, so in, in terms of surging, I think that that term may have come actually from the mouths of some leader, DOJ leadership last mm -hmm. fall. Um, and I think what the idea there was to signal to the market that corporate criminal investigations and prosecutions were going to see an uptick. And the way that DOJ is able to accomplish that is by throwing resources at the problem um, by way of um, money and human resources like bodies, whether they be prosecutors or in terms of initiating investigations, um, just as importantly to, to throw um, FBI agents at the issues. And they increased, DOJ increased the, the fraud group um, uh, from an FBI perspective at Maine Justice. Um, and so I think that what we'll see is there, there's a little bit of lag coming out of COVID and, and, and administration changes, but there's definitely going to be um, some results. And I think consistent with the idea of having practitioners like ourselves who focus on different agencies. But what we're seeing, I think, is, and what we're going to see is a lot of the big cases and upticks are going to be areas in which there is parallel um, or overlapping uh, uh, prosecutions and investigations, whether it be DOJ and CFTC, DOJ and SEC, or all three of them at times. And I think those kinds of matters, and we'll talk a little more about that, you're going to see that in places like crypto prosecutions, um, the private fund space is an area in which you're getting um, the SEC talking about enforcement and re increased regulation. You're getting DOJ going out to conferences and saying, we're, we're going to look carefully at the private fund space. And then you're seeing you know, cases, as Jackie said, slowly follow, or not slowly, but shortly thereafter follow. So DOJ knows what they're talking about. They know what's in the pipeline when they say these things. Um, they're not they're not random. Um, and I think, you know, that's that's what we're going to see. I think there's a little bit of a uh, perhaps um, the DOJ Maine's a little distracted by some of the events of the day. Um, I think uh, uh, focus on Russia and sanctions and the klepto capture task force is going to take resources at DOJ. Um, massive backlog of January 6 cases. So DOJ Maine may be a little distracted. There may be some shift here and there, but I think the by building up the FBI um, and prosecutorial resources, you're going to see a lot more corporate enforcement coming forward, uh, and which also overlaps with some of the policy changes that I know folks have talked about in other webinars um, that were announced late last year related to prosecutions and investigations of, of uh, corporations, namely the sort of return back to the Yates memo and the requirement for cooperation um, 
to get um, for, for all relevant facts relating to all individuals responsible, not just substantially responsible, things like that. These sort of policy changes will impact um, prosecutions going forward in the corporate space. Yeah, look, there's a lot of that going on. And, and I'm about to talk about that everyone needs to buckle in because we're going to spend about 40 minutes total on seven topics. But um, it is, you know, since you mentioned that, it's really interesting. The SEC is, you know, one of the things that was uh, stated by, by Chair Gensler was that he's considering, you know, a, a, and, and it was reiterated by Gruel, um, he, they're considering the idea of, um, demanding admissions and at the SEC space, you know, that's a, a great explanation to what you just said, Glenn, that there's a, a shift and those things are going to start coming into play. Um, we're going to talk all about that and the same, you know, they are, um, as Jackie and as Glenn said, um, this takes us right to our first topic here that is a specific topic, employee use of unapproved devices. Uh, you know, they both hit upon the concept that um, that as soon as a statement is made that the SEC comes out with a, a case um, to hit that in the background and to show that that's really happening. That's uh, almost exactly what Jackie was explaining to you that she's seeing. And so in October 2021, um, Enforcement Director Gruwald stated out loud that um, the Division of Enforcement wants to warn companies that they need to be actively thinking about and addressing the many compliance issues raised by increased use of personal devices, new communication channels, and other technology developments like ephemeral apps. Um, and this we are seeing over and over again in a way that for um, a couple of, well, I, I'm old enough, it used to be paper. And, and you know, when I was at the SEC in the 90s, people would back up semi-tractor -tra trailers of paper to try to bury us in it. Um, then it became email and pretty email exclusive. Uh, trying to go, you know, Glenn, in your world, trying to go image the servers um, uh, you know, with your teams and, and grab that before anyone could destroy anything and, and grabbing all the email you possibly could. But now it is a real signal to the industry that they are really interested in text messages, IMs, other manners of speaking to each other, including, by the way, chat functions in programs like we're using right now, and whether or not those are recorded and collected by the company and whether or not they have to be. Uh, right after uh, Gruwal made that statement that you better be careful about personal devices and the fact that you are required to keep business records and the business communications of, of your work uh, in the financial industry and, and in the public company industry and to some extent, um, there was an announcement of a $125 million settlement against a large financial institution, essentially for not retaining electronic communications from its employees' devices. Um, Matt, I'm going to throw that to you for a second as I set that up, because as I understand it, and, and I, I know I'm right, uh, we talked about this yesterday, so thank you for telling me that the CFTC settled that action for a serious amount of money as well. Yeah, 75 million actually. And so this is a big, big issue in the CFTC space. It has been for a number of years. Really, there's two rules relevant CFTC rules 131 and 135. And from my perspective, there's two core issues. Um, the first one, which should be easy uh, in theory, is make sure you have uh, robust procedures, robust policies and procedures. Make sure they at least say the right things and, and cover all the, you know, the, uh, the requisite details. Um, surprisingly, uh, there are a lot of procedures out there that we've seen that, that are deficient on their face. But that's number one. Again, check your procedures, make sure that this particular issue is addressed straight on. Number two, which is a little bit more difficult, is, is practice, right? So you may have great procedures, um, but if you're a large organization, you've got brokers, you've got employees out there doing whatever they do, and does practice um, comply with the, with the procedures? Oftentimes, it'll be the case but these procedures have got to have a mechanism, a way to address monitoring, to, to make sure that you're testing and actually seeking to ensure compliance with the procedures. And some of these scenarios get really difficult. You know, let's say um, a system is down uh, with respect to recording a phone call. Uh, what is a broker supposed to do? Not take business? How do you address that in your procedures? You know, from an enforcement perspective, 
that, you know, it, it, generally speaking, would be a mitigating factor, not a free pass, if you will, but that's also something that can be discussed with staff, but addressing the more difficult issues um, and scenarios in the procedures, in training with brokers and others is, is the real key to this. And the CFTC has made, care, made, made clear um, with respect to the enforcement action mentioned by Rich and the parallel action by the CFTC that it's gonna hold firms accountable um, and, um, and the penalties can be severe. So Jackie, what are you seeing in, in your space in this respect? Sorry. Um, so, I mean, exactly the same as both of you that both of you have already said. Um, you know, in addition to that one um, case that you've both talked about being um, disclosed right after these comments, um, we also saw a number of other broker dealers disclose in their um, public filings that they had received subpoenas from SEC um, investigating. You know what the could be what people are terming off-channel communications um, and, and what their retention policies are around those uh, type of communications. So it indicated that there was, um, you know, not, not just a one-off uh, situation that was going to a particular institution, but rather there was actually an entire enforcement sweep going on um, with, with a number of broker dealers. Uh, and, and SEC has really indicated that there, there are two concerns with this. It's, it's not just from a regulatory standpoint of, um, you know, making sure that the record keeping obligations um, are being complied with um, to just, you know, maintain market integrity as is the SEC's mission. Um, but they are also concerned that this is going to impede their investigations um, once those, you know, take place because they're going to lose important uh, data as employees kind of shift their communications to these other channels, you know, intentionally or not, perhaps just due to the pandemic itself and the way we have all sort of shifted the way we interact with one another, um, you know, or perhaps in, in, in an intentional way, um, thinking that these types of communications won't be captured. Hey, Glenn, what's DOJ you know, doing here? Because I always I always think of DOJ as being sort of weirdly in in this particular instance in the forefront, right? They these are communications that they've grabbed for years. It's sort of you know when I was when I was detailed out, we we were working on grabbing stuff out of the air from point to point communications, let alone um, you know text messages from phones. And I, I what where's DOJ right now on this? Which I think it sort of echoes some of what what Jackie was saying is the expectation that records are going to be maintained when they do the investigation. Um, and, and DOJ maybe has some, some significant tools at their disposal um, to grab uh, personal devices and communications on personal devices. But I think the way DOJ has sort of come at this is to signal to the, the market what their expectations are so that from a record keeping standpoint because you don't have sort of DOJ criminal guidelines on or, or criminal law on record keeping, right? You don't have those kind of regulations. So the way it's set up with DOJ is within the corporate enforcement policy, which okay. nominally is under the, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, but has applications across um, corporate criminal prosecutions and investigations in order to qualify um, for uh, uh, full cooperation credit and uh, under the policy in order to get during the course of an investigation, say a declination or a very positive result from DOJ. One of the elements, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but getting to one of the elements is this sort of timely and appropriate remediation. And what DOJ has said um, in the most recent version of the enforcement policy, and I'll read this to be so it's clear to folks, is that a company must have in place what they call appropriate retention of business records and prohibiting the improper destruction or deletion of business records, including implementing appropriate guidance and controls on the use of personal communications and ephemeral, ephemeral messaging platforms that undermine the company's ability to appropriately retain business records or communications. And so the idea really is you're giving companies a heads up that you've got to deal with this issue. It's a somewhat of a change because a couple of years earlier, DOJ said you can't use ephemeral messaging um, for work. And so there's a bit of a pullback and sort of we're going to let 
businesses make their own business judgment about the best way to manage this. Um, but the minute you see, you know, issues in terms of failure to have policies in place or failure to follow those policies, there's going to be serious consequences for corporations in the context of pre-existing investigations. And I think that's it. And that ties into what Matt was saying and frankly ties into a comment that was made by a member of the audience. Thanks, Stuart, uh, on the idea that a lot of businesses grabbed onto the idea of bring your own device, right? BYOD. Um, and what you can use that uh, as your as your corporate communications, but it's a really difficult thing to control. And so the pendulum swung, as Matt was saying, and a lot of folks just said, um, you know, forget it. Uh, you can't use any personal devices. And so um, I, I think what we're seeing now is in the pandemic, that just didn't work. Uh, everyone was communicating however they needed to. Matt alluded to a real time case that wasn't just sort of an academic theory on the idea that, um, that if a system goes down, you still need to communicate. Sometimes there's a requirement to to fulfill your duties or potentially fiduciary duties have an obligation of making sure you're communicating with others. How do you balance that? The only reason, and there's more comments in the, in the question, the only reason and I'm sorry for this, each of these topics has, um, Mayor Brown alone is doing webinars on each of these topics. Please watch them. Um, it could be forever, but I want to I wanna keep us moving through. I want to get to crypto and Glenn, I'm going to throw it right back to you if that makes sense, because I think um, that everybody has something to say on crypto. There's even a question in the, in the, in the question and answer. Um, but I, I think we should start with DOJ and crypto. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And then we can go through um, the focus of both, uh, you know, Matt, the CFTC and the SEC. Sure, sure, Rich. I'll, I'll take that. I mean, look, DOJ has been prosecuting crypto cases for years. I think what you've seen is now sort of this steady um, buildup at DOJ Maine of a focus on trying to coordinate crypto uh, prosecutions. And so in October, along with a number of other policy uh, changes, DOJ announced the creation of the National Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team. Uh, they named the head of that team uh, just a couple months ago, I think in February. And so the idea there was to coordinate and to bring to bear expertise in crypto prosecutions across the U.S. attorney's offices around the country and sort of provide guidance um, to those offices and to have a focused expertise in that area because historically of the cases you've seen in the crypto space have been sort of low-hanging fruit right there, Ponzi schemes, which are just, you know, classic schemes that DOJ prosecutes in the, in the white collar space, but using crypto, right? And then there's um, the touting cases, right? Which you'll see in the securities world. Um, now we're seeing it from uh, folks selling uh, and looking for retail investors um, in crypto. The next phase, and there's, a, there's been a little bit of this already, but is in the exchanges, right? Um, and those are more complicated cases, more complex. So the GOJ is trying to get this expertise together, bring smart folks together, and then disseminate and, and, and provide guidance out to the world. And, and when I talk about the exchanges, a big piece of this overlaps with Bank, Bank Secrecy Act requirements and, and BSA stuff. And so um, uh, uh, the exchanges as gatekeepers is going to be a big focus. And I think that's going to overlap with some 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 of some the other prosecutions from folks like the CFTC and the SEC. I, they, I love the way this is, this is almost too nicely flowing back and forth. Um, you know, Matt, you want to jump in and sure. then Jackie and I can clean up with the SEC? Sure. We could, of course, spend a day on this, but I'm going to literally yeah. try to spend about two minutes. OK, so we know several years ago, the CFTC said essentially all cryptocurrencies are commodities under the Commodity Exchange Act. So that means the CFTC uh, has a basis to take an enforcement action if there's an element of fraud, <clears throat> excuse me, or manipulation. Um, the CFTC uh, also, with respect to commodity interest, based on cryptocurrency. So if we have a swap, for example, or a futures contract based on cryptocurrencies, the CFTC can not only take enforcement action, but it can also um, uh, has regular regulatory authority as well. And so impose registration requirements, day-to-day -day requirements, so on and so forth. And so what the CFTC has been advocating, and certainly generated a lot of headlines over the past month or so, is to be the, the, the regulatory authority with respect to spot crypto transactions, even ostensibly if those spot crypto transactions are securities. 
So you can see that there's going to be an interesting, um, you know, um, potential collision course here between two federal agencies. Yeah. We'll see how all that fleshes out. But from a market participant perspective, you know, the one thing market participants want, and particularly institutional investors, is some sort of regulatory clarity. Who's going to regulate what and when? And unfortunately, um, we're in the midst of, of, of frankly, trying to, uh, to hash that out. From the enforcement that, perspective, yeah. really quickly on that point, you know, as someone in the audience had mentioned that even the states are jumping in, that it could take, we could take all day and talk exactly. about the states versus the joint idea of the SEC and the CFTC. Um, but I am seeing a bit of a piling on. I don't know if you are as well, where um, I've got a couple of cases uh, in, in this area, especially in the idea of whether something should have been registered or not, where the CFTC is interested, the SEC is interested, and seven or eight states are also interested all at the same time. And so I am I think there's not a lot of clarity in that area. Are you right. finding the same thing? Yeah, there, there's a complete lack of clarity yeah. and uh. you get into issues about preemption if, if a federal regulator is given authority. Um, and so that's a debate that I, unfortunately- I, I, I wanna let you go on, but I, I wanted to like, just down. hammer home your point that I think there's a complete lack of clarity right now and it's it's and, and entities are bearing the brunt of that. So it's part of your calculus and it has to be of whether or not you're gonna register um, from the start yeah. in, in yeah. my opinion, but go ahead. So one more quick point is uh, I think a, a real focus for the CFTC from an enforcement perspective in crypto has been on non-US markets in mm -hmm. particular and those doing business, crypto business outside the US where there's a nexus to the US. Maybe it's operations here, maybe it's US traders, investors, whatever the case may be. We've seen some interesting enforcement actions involving spot crypto transactions, where there's an allegation again of fraud, of misconduct or yet manipulation. And the focus is on how certain smart contracts are designed and whether or not those smart contracts uh, by virtue of allowing persons to take a view, you know, based upon a certain event here, and then cash out uh, on that view based upon a certain event here, where all this works via smart contracts, and effectively those smart contracts are swaps. Mm -hmm. And then by virtue of being swaps, they're not being reported, the platform isn't properly registered. And so that's been, a, again, intense focus of the CFTC and, and, and not likely to slow down in that respect. And if you're a CFTC registrant, so you're registered as a swap dealer, FCMIB, whatever the case may be, um, with the CFTC, have to be mindful of NFA bylaw 1101, which essentially says that if you're a CFTC registrant and NFA member, you can't do business with an entity that's supposed to be registered, but isn't. So if you're engaged in certain you know, offshore activities with unregistered entities, make sure you do your due diligence um, so you can uh, satisfy your obligations under bylaw 1101. Uh, we haven't seen that uh, be too much of an issue yet, but um, have a strong, strong sense it's going to become an issue in the in the near future. So, Rich, um, yeah, look, back I, to you. yeah, I think the best way to talk about the SEC really quickly, because at some point we're just going to run out of room for all of our topics. Uh, but I think the best way is to talk really quickly in numbers. Uh, you know, and the, honestly, the SEC has brought nearly a hundred cases in eight years. Um, in 2021, there were more than 20 of those of those 100 cases just came in 2021 alone. Um, the, the total of the cases is something like $2.35 billion um, worth of monetary penalties. Uh, 14 of those cases litigated, 14 of them related, a separate 14 of them related to ICOs. 65% uh, were fraud cases, 80% were unregistered security cases. Remember, unregistered securities can be a fraud, so they, they would be both of them. It's not that it's 145%. Um, and 55% and of those, which will tell you your math right there, is both of those things. Uh, you know, Ed Gensler in, in April of 2017 said crypto was a, uh, was a priority. And importantly, in February, just in February of 2022, um, Director Gerwal said in, in a very interesting comment that industry had sort of been waiting to say, look, if we haven't registered, but we can see the way the winds are blowing, are you guys going to do an amnesty program? Because the SEC has done that so often for folks to register and, and get out of the idea that, well, it was really unclear. It was hard to tell. And in many, in many instances, that's all true. And Gerwal said out loud that there will be no amnesty. 
for failing to register. I just think that's a really interesting place to state. Yeah. The reason I state that is it gives you a really good idea, quite frankly, of how the SEC is thinking. They are going to, they're 100 cases in eight years. They are going to be regulating this industry as hard as they can. Matt, you were jumping in? Quick question, Rich. So with all these, you know, largely consent orders, is the SEC effectively trying to make law here, um, uh, you know, in lieu of rulemaking, or is it just the application of existing laws? I think, I mean, I think that's a great question. And I think the answer is, honestly, they were trying for quite a while to figure out what they were going to do. Um, you know, first, was it a security way back in, in, you know, in 11, 12? What were we dealing with here? How big was it going to get? Um, I would argue that the regulators are always five to 10 years behind the markets in every market. And I think we're now eight, nine years into this thing. And, you know, and you could argue that it was around, you know, decades before that. And I get that, but really into this thing where you're having, you know, ICOs, registration questions um, and, and massive uh, turns to, to crypto. I think that they've wrapped their head around the fact that they are going to regulate it. They're going to, and they are truly not sure how they want to write the rules. So they're regulating it through enforcement. And I think that's pushing it towards everything has to register because otherwise you're in danger of all the things we've actually just talked about. Um, and so in my, in my mind, I think that that's the way we're looking right now. I think you're only several years away from, from, from rulemaking because I think the industry is going to push back in a hard way. And I think the world, and I say that honestly, right? It's sort of, if this is the way money is going, that is going to have pushback and it's going to require certainty and codification. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be pushed upon them to make the rules. Jackie, I would love if you would get us to crypto as we are rolling through these top. I'm sorry, to SPACs as we are rolling through these topics. Slowly rolling. Yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> and you knew it was going to be slow. Yeah. Too much to say on each topic. Go exactly. ahead. Exactly. Um, yeah, each of these could be uh, their own presentation, as we've already said. And, and in fact, on SPACs, there is um, a presentation later this month uh, by Mayor Brown lawyers uh, talking about the new regulations that have been proposed on SPAC. SPACs, but um, taking us back through the timeline and starting kind of chronologically to set the stage, what, you know, what happened here is there was a convergence of factors where, you know, as we all know, in 2020 and 2021, the usage of SPACs in IPOs dramatically increased, like very dramatically increased. Um, in 2020, it was um, the, the money raised was nearly twice as much as the previous 10 years combined. And then we saw it again double in 2021. Uh, the number of SPACs are, uh, uh, you know, also notable. I think the, the um, average between 2003 and 2019, so sort of the 15 years before this uh, trend started happening, the average was um, 23 SPAC IPOs in a year. Um, in 2020, there were 248, and in 2021, there were 613. Um, so, you know, that obviously was a, a notable trend starting. And then at the same time that all these SPAC IPOs um, are going on, and that's a, a new way to, um, to do a transaction, um, what was happening is that the company stock post merger was terribly underperforming. And so you, you take both of these trends and um, obviously it's gonna peak interest of regulators, which is exactly what happened. So um, with respect to SEC, um, in late 2020, they began their parade of public statements uh, indicating their intention to scrutinize SPACs with um, Corp Fin publishing guidance about conflicts of interest, um, and the differing incentives between SPAC sponsors and investors. In March 2021, um, we saw the, um, the acting chief accountant, who, who is still Paul Munter, make a statement um, about investors um, carefully considering the risks of SPAC mergers. Um, in April 2021, we saw uh, John Coates, who was the then actor, acting director of Corp Fin, issue another statement um, discussing liability risks in uh, DSPAC transactions. And he also raised the question of, of whether investors are currently sufficiently protected by the regulatory framework that, that is in place right now. 
And then we saw in June 2021, SEC included SPACs on the list of areas for proposed rulemaking. Um, shortly after that, you know, there had been enforcement actions that had happened during this time um, where th there was action taken against the company post-merger. Um, but what we hadn't seen um, up until this point was uh, enforcement action against the SPAC itself um, pre-merger. And uh, we actually saw that happen in, in July 2021, um, where before the proposed, the SPAC had completed its IPO, announced a merger. Before the merger closed, SEC brought charges um, against really everyone. I mean, the SPAC, the SPAC sponsor, all of the individuals, um, as well as the, uh, the target entity. And um, Jackie, I, I think, I mean, that's really interesting, right? I think that that really made a statement in the marketplace. And I've seen a bit of a, a you know, anecdotally a downturn in SPACs for, for a couple of years. All I saw was I, I saw no IPOs, sort of. <laughs> I just saw SPACs everywhere. And of course, there were IPOs, but but sort of only the very largest ones. And um, and SPACs were everywhere. I've, I've always said that it's akin to um, the, this sort of shell corporate, shell public corporation that was sitting out there and in the 80s and 90s that they would reverse merge uh, a company into so that it could be public without actually having to do an IPO and that the SEC was going to, to regulate it. Um, much like Matt asked me a second ago on crypto, uh, same question, right? Is, it, is the SEC, and I'm happy to sort of talk this through with you, but is the SEC you know, going to come out with rules or is this, are we seeing legislation through enforcement here? Um, so I think we were seeing legislation through enforcement, um, but actually very recently on March 30th, um, the SEC did propose new rules that would enhance um, disclosures as well as investor protection in SPAC IPOs and DSPAC transactions. Um, essentially, I mean, this is actually what the, the um, Mayor Brown presentation later this month will cover will cover in detail what these proposed rules um, would require. So I won't go into that now, also given time. But essentially, what they, what they would do is more closely align the required financial statements of the private uh, operating companies and SPAC transactions to those that are required in registration statements for a traditional IPO. And so again, kind of taking some of you know really the the purpose of why these um, companies were doing it through SPACs, um, but taking that risk out of the transaction so that the investors are still protected. Um, Glenn, I, I think maybe take it to Glenn. Did you want, I mean, anything to add from a DOJ perspective? I mean, DOJ is sort of trailing in this world, um, in, in yeah. essence. And again, it's really a focus on um, investor protection. And I think, you know, an example of when DOJ gets involved sort of in a SPAC-like context is that Nicola case um, and, and Milton. And I think there's an interesting overlap of SPAC transaction plus the use of um, uh, 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 new media technologies and um, social media to allegedly manipulate stock price, right, or company value um, through using those kind of social media platforms. And that was the basis for um, the allegations and the indictment back in, in June of 21. And I think that case continues and has seen some upholding of some challenges by the defendant. Uh, but I think there's just, you know, fraud on investors, um, use of social media, some interesting overlaps for DOJ going forward. But I don't know that the SPAC world is necessarily going to be um, moved one way or the other through DOJ action on this. Yeah, uh, interesting. I, you know, the, my, I don't know why, but what stuck in my brain there was I, I just have some inside information on this. Um, and, and I think it's pronounced Nikola. And I know that because Tesla was taken. And so they decided to use his first name instead <laughs> uh, as the company. So as, as, as Nikola Tesla, the individual, not speaking about either company. Uh, but that just cracked me up because uh, I got that wrong for many months and, and, then, and then learned it. Um, look, I think it's, if I may, there's, we could, I feel like I could talk about 
all of these, but crypto and specs, you know, all day. And so anyone who's interested if you, and wants to hear me talk, because I'm more than willing, anyone who knows me on this call, I, I'm more than willing to do it. Um, but Matt, I want to get, I definitely want to get to spoofing and manipulation. And then Jackie, I'm going to tee you up. I, I really want to get to ESG as well today um, at a minimum. So Matt, you want to sure. talk a little about CFTC spoofing sure. and manipulation? And we're going to talk about it with Glenn, I think as well, because as you mentioned earlier, there's a real, um, purposeful interconnect between CFTC and DOJ here. Big time. And so I'm sure everyone knows the headlines involving spoofing and manipulation. CFTC has been aggressive. Glenn shortly will talk about the DOJ, the SEC and FINRA. We've had a lot, number of actions with them, investigations with them as well. So um, spoofing, of course, placing an order with the intent to cancel it prior to execution or manipulation with these, which these days almost seems like just someone trying to get something they wouldn't otherwise do, uh, but for the action of the alleged manipulator, um, continue to be darlings of the regulators. Um, there has been a dip, I would say, maybe in enforcement activity over the last year or so, um, but generally uh, prosecutions remain strong and the nature of the activity really just is, you know, some of this sadly is, is almost human nature. It's not going away. Um, there will continue to be different forms. Envelopes will be pushed. I think if one thing, regulators are focusing more on the notion of disruption. Um, so not necessarily spoofing and bogus orders, but if there is a disruptive order or trading strategy, might even be something like a, a rogue or uh, an algorithm that trades in an unintended fashion. Um, and the parameters are off. Um, that's been the basis for a number of actions, but essentially, causes other market, par market participants to do something they wouldn't otherwise do. Um, and that envelope, I think, will continue to be pushed. So ultimately, um, and based on just what we're seeing in the pipeline, there will be more prosecutions um, going forward. And Glenn, we've talked a lot about this on, on other webinars. Do you want to touch on the DOJ a little bit? Sure, Matt. I'll, I'll be quick with that. I mean, I think, as, as you noted, there's there was sort of a historical uptick um, from a DOJ perspective in the sort of 18, 19, 20 building from probably as far back as the first spoofing cases in, in, in 2015, in part because the spoofing statute is relatively new, right? And so you're looking forward in that conduct. A lot of these cases, I think, that have been brought over the last couple of years have been backward looking. It's an early conduct back in the 2010 to 2015 period. Um, and so we'll see, maybe, maybe the message has been heard by the market um, in terms of the aggressive nature by which both the CFTC and DOJ um, have tried to prosecute spoofing. Again, this is a situation in which I think DOJ put assets you know, in terms of money and, and focused prosecutors on these issues and there were results. I think you saw cases less successful early on, more successful um, in, uh, going forward. And we've got, I think a real watershed case perhaps is coming up in, uh, this year and using the RICO statute to charge sort of a whole desk of traders at a bank um, with sort of spoofing related conduct. And I think that was a situation in which DOJ is looking at its um, its toolbox and saying we can be creative, we can be aggressive here, and and setting a precedent that I think um, so far so good for DOJ in terms of uh, withholding legal challenges to the use of RICO in spoofing and, and market manipulation cases. So um, we'll see how the, the trial uh, works out ultimately, but um, it, it seems to have slowed down somewhat in terms of new cases. But that doesn't mean that the cases in the pipeline won't start popping as 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 the year goes. And Rich, if I can, just one key point to make, because it's an increased focus of the CFTC, the SEC, FINRA, the DOJ, is what are you doing to monitor trading activity? And, and really in details, right? So your surveillance system, I mean, regulators are unpacking the parameters. Are they appropriately set? Are they tailored? Are they aggressive enough? A lot of detail there. Well, if you haven't focused on that and you've got trading operations, um, strongly recommend you do so. Yeah, Matt, I mean, now I, I have to jump in and add 20 more seconds on that because we have a couple of cases on that that we're defending. And when you say look at the details, how were those decisions determined is also right. You know, how, you know, how aggressive, how not aggressive, how are you going to do this? Um, what do you mandate? What don't you mandate? Um, and who made those determinations from a supervision um, and, and oversight context? So we are seeing it 
Um, I've seen it go in great detail down and then branch back up almost the left turn pivot we all hear about in an investigation. You know, once the details are known and they have a hook into a small issue, it turns into, well, why didn't management know that? Why didn't management review that? Mm -hmm. How are these things reviewed? And then it just turns into how is everything reviewed? And I'm seeing that happen sort of over and over again now. Cases that I think even a couple of years ago and for the last couple of decades would have been resolved fairly quickly against the entity itself only are now digging into who individually is responsible, how those decisions were made. And if we have this thing that happened, doesn't it mean that you must have had a flaw, um, a, super, a lapse of supervision or whatever else? So it, it's a fascinating, you know, I really took on what you said right there. Um, and I don't want to steal too much time from everything else we're going to talk about. But um, but I think that's a really important point on, on um, understanding that you need to have everything buttoned up. Um, and at a certain point, there's only so much you can do. So don't lose the forest for the trees either. As the SEC looks at each individual aspect, don't let them make you believe, and the CFTC, don't make them like, that you believe that you should have done this differently or that you were inadequate because that one little thing should have been done differently when it's so immaterial to the enterprise as a whole, no manager would ever look at that particular issue in the abstract. Um, it's sort of really important stuff to keep in mind and, and I'm fascinated that that's where you brought it back around. Um, I do wanna get to, it's such a hot topic and we are not gonna do it justice nor have we done any of these topics justice other than to give you a flavor of what the regulators are thinking about, which is our intention this whole time. Um, and I hope that that's useful and the things that you should be, we think, potentially focusing on this year and maybe the next couple. Um, you know, Jackie, you, you brought this up when we've been talking about thinking about this presentation and, and you're, you're dead on right. There's news, you know, as early, as recently as yesterday on, on ESG. Um, you know, could you start us off on ESG? And I have a feeling we may all chime in. Um, yes. So obviously can't have a government enforcement program without, without at least mentioning ESG. Um, no need to rehash sort of all the investor demand for this um, or the massive amount of public statements um, by various government officials that have taken place over the last couple of years. Um, I think what we've seen with respect to SEC is there actually haven't been a lot of enforcement. They're not regulating by enforcement right now. Um, what they have sort of jumped to instead is to actually just regulate um, through their proposed rules. Um, and so on March 21st, SEC did propose rules um, that if adopted would require companies to disclose the details of how climate change is affecting their businesses. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of companies that already sort of do that um, voluntarily, um, but this would require, um, you know, maybe others to do so, maybe a little bit more in the way of what's being disclosed. Um, it also would require companies to report um, greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. And um, this is one of the more controversial aspects of the proposed rules. And um, there's various scopes and I won't get into it now. You can um, watch the, there's another Mayor Brown um, a webinar happening on, on the, these rules. Um, but anyway, there's various scopes of greenhouse gas emissions and what would be required. And one of the scopes is um, particularly problematic because it really, um, requires a company sort of look down their chain into things that are very difficult for them to predict what the uh, greenhouse gas emissions would be and then try to somehow um, estimate those and disclose them. Um, so there has been a, a substantial number of it's we're in the comment period right now um, and there have been already six about 6,000 comments um, received. Um, you know I think they span that Obviously, I've not read them all. Some of them are quite interesting, though. Um, well, well, what are uh, we here for, Jackie? <laughs> <laughs> um, they span the gamut of supporting um, and not. Um, there was an interesting one by um, by Etsy um, favoring the rules, and then of course, there's um, a lot of others that that do not. Um, you know, obviously, it imposes a significant amount of cost on these companies. Um, another thing that's being pointed to is, is, like I said, especially with respect to scope three emissions, there's um, very little 
um, uncertainty that that they could estimate these things in any um, way that would actually provide um, reliable information to investors and and therefore the argument is you know why would we provide much of information that we don't even that that really is quite controversial it may not be reliable. Um, yeah. yeah if you haven't read it um hester pierce one of the sec commissioners um, who was the only dissenting commissioner to these proposed rules issued um, a dissenting statement on them that that really is um quite comprehensive in, in the reasons why she did not support um, the proposed rules. Um, but, but foremost, it really questions SEC's authority as to whether they have uh, the power to enact the rules. Um, and others have, have advanced similar constitutional arguments, um, even attacking the rules from a First Amendment perspective. Um, that it's requiring compelled speech, which is in violation of the First Amendment. So we'll see what happens. I expect um, that there will be, you know, a, a, a thousands and thousands of more comments um, submitted. And, and then we'll see if this actually even gets uh, challenged in, in the courts. I'm, I'm really interested in the will uh, of the SEC here. As, as recently as this morning, I read in the papers that Congress was starting to um, it was starting to rally um, about this uh, proposed rule and, and that 40 members of, of, of uh, the Republican caucus had, had commented. Um, I think you know, with thousands and thousands of comments like the SEC is receiving with Congress um, potentially making this without, without discussing either side, making it a political football. I'm curious, you know, the SEC in my experience for years and years has always been, you know, cognizant of Congress and its need to go before Congress and talk to Congress. And I think that that's a, a, something that really might uh, coalesce this into a, a review of, of the rulemaking. And, and I'm curious to see how they react, um, not necessarily to Congress, but to the comments, right? To the public comments and, and see what they shift. Um, and particularly as you talked about with Commissioner Pierce, um, outlining what she did, I think that there's room for shifting from the SEC. I don't know what they'll do. I really don't. Uh, but I am interested to see where this heads. Um, the argument, of course, from the SEC's behalf would be that's what the comment period is for, right? It's for this very thing. Um, there's even arguments right now, by the way, out there how politicized this has become that the comment period itself isn't long enough. Um, and that's becoming, a, you know, its own political football. And I'm not sure the SEC realize the, the sort of can of worms it was opening, you know, Pandora's box it was opening by this rule making process. But I think this one might really have legs and be interesting to follow. Um, Matt, uh, Glenn, I didn't sure. want to stop you from jumping no. on ESG. I think it's such a hot topic. Yeah, yeah. It, it has been a big focus of CFTC Chairman Benham, um, and particularly the role of um, environmental commodities and trading of carbon, which has exploded in the last couple of years, the last few years. We've had a lot of discussions with CFTC staff about when certain types of products like forwards or spots might actually be swaps or when are they converted into swaps and certain types of those carbon contracts, emission contracts have optionality. Are those swaps or are those, opt or do they have embedded uh, optionality that converts them into swaps, which of course would make, make them subject to CFTC regulation. And so, while there hasn't been any enforcement around those issues, clearly a lot of interest from a regulatory perspective and some, right. um, some questions um, that, that abound that hopefully the CFTC will address in the near future. A, a real life, I mean, I just sent you one of those from a European client of ours, Matt, a couple of weeks ago, that very topic. I mean, that's giving you some real time understanding. I mean, the people listening, not you, Matt, <laughs> the real time understanding of, of this issue being hot. I mean, and as hot as it is right now, um, and it's not, you know, it's anyone who touches the US right now is interested right. in, in what's happening on the ESG front and sort of has to be. Um, Glenn, I'm in a short trip to here only because it's noon. Uh, and, and I do, you know, Matt, I wanna let you keep talking for just a minute to touch. I think we're gonna have to jettison supervision. It's a great topic and I wanna do it, but I'd love to let you touch insider trading and then give out the, the code again and, and wrap us up if that makes sense, Matt. 
Yeah, well, just to say, so insider trading in the commodities markets is prohibited. We all know it's prohibited <laughs> in securities markets. Everybody has securities related insider trading uh, provisions. You should have ones related to commodities trading if your organization is in those markets. The CFTC has been aggressive in terms of bringing enforcement actions where there is a misuse, whether by an organization or an employee of things like uh, customer positions or intentions or orders, uh, breaches of fiduciary duty, so on and so forth. Only in the last couple of years or few years has the CFTC stepped up and brought enforcement actions and there's a task force and they're serious about it. And Glenn, you know about that too because the DOJ has been paired in some of those. That's right, Matt. I mean, Rule 180.1, sort of a um, commodities version of um, 10b-5. You've seen DOJ bring their first cases, I think it was a year or so ago. I expect they'll continue to do that um, as they you know, continue that close relationship with, um, with the CFTC on commodities trading. As recently as five or six years ago, I had longtime folks tell me I've been in the, the commodity space for 30 years and there is no insider trading in our space. So it is not as silly as it sounds for Matt to say this is a violation um, at the top of this thing. In the securities folks, it sounds so silly because insider trading has sort of always been there. Um, in the commodity space, it is a real thing to understand. And to understand what Glenn just said, that DOJ is going to put people in prison, right? I mean, like literally. Really, this is an incredibly hot topic. We are short shrifting it here. The only thing I'm going to add from an SEC perspective is the hot area there is protection of MNPI, whether or not there's harm. So forget the insider trading itself, whether or not you are maintaining and protecting as you are required over MNPI. It started with broker dealers who have a duty to do so under 15G. It has bled to investment advisors. And I think that's only going to broaden as a topic right now. Um, so look, honestly, you know, that essentially is really all the time we have today. 